Well, good morning and welcome to uh, our Bible class period time. It's time to take our seats, if you would, please. Happy New Year to everyone and welcome to winter. Where did our, our nice warm weather go? Well, it was, it's gone, at least for a couple of days. Tom said it would be 80 tomorrow, so. <laughs> It'll be close enough to it. If you, what is it they say? If you don't like the weather in Texas, just stick around and it will. That's right. Well, we're glad that you're here this morning. We're studying uh, this series of lessons entitled The Major Events in the Life of Christ. And this morning we continue our lesson that we began last week. So I hope you brought your study sheet with you. If not, we've got scripture that we can follow along and uh, study from there. But I'd like for you this morning to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2 once again. To Luke chapter 2. And thus far, we've discussed basically the birth of Christ through the, about the time he was 12 years old. And then some significant events took place in the life of the family of Christ, of Mary and Joseph, and some, shall we, I would say, maturing thoughts that came to the mind of, of uh, Mary and Joseph from some things that Jesus had said. But look, if you will, at Luke chapter 2, and starting there at verse 40. Luke chapter 2, and beginning at verse 40, the scripture reads, And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This was a time in which Jesus and their family had just returned from Egypt, where uh, they had to hide for a short period of time, due to the threats of Pharaoh. But as they had returned to Nazareth, we begin to see the youth of the Christ child, starting with that verse that we just read there in verse 40. And then, of course, you're very familiar with the story in which Jesus and his family goes to the city of Jerusalem to the feast of the Passover, Luke chapter 2 in verse 41. The scripture in verse 42 says, and when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom, according to custom. And at the time that Jesus and his parents were there in Jerusalem, what happened? They were separated. And Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, his parents unaware of the situation, thinking that he was in the group that they were with heading back to their native home, and it took a short period of time for them to realize he's not here with us. So the Bible says, and they went back to where? They went back to the city of Jerusalem. They returned there searching for him. Luke chapter 2 and verse 45. Three days later, they find him in the temple. And was he just kind of just sitting around waiting, thinking, well, where, where have you been? No, what was going on? He was talking. Notice, if you will, verse 46. Sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Of course, parents, being concerned as they were, asked the question. Look there at verse 48. Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And then verse 49 tells the story. He says to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business or I must be in my father's house? What would you think if you heard this answer from any ordinary 12-year-old? You'd be amazed. But Jesus was not just an ordinary 12-year-old. He was speaking 
as what? The Son of God. Exactly. Speaking as the Son of God. Speaking the words of the Son of God. Speaking the wisdom of God. They did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. Verse 50. But nonetheless, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up these things in her heart. And then the chapter closes out, Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Now, I want us to take a look at that particular passage for a couple moments. There are several things that Luke, the writer, points out about Jesus in this verse. Number one, he's increasing in what? In stature. Meaning what? Physical development. He was developing properly as, as a person would physically. Realizing that he was, culti- he was needing to cultivate good and wholesome habits in his life. And he realized that he was just here for a short time. Just like we need to realize our time here on earth is brief. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to whom? We belong to the Lord. We're God's possession. Then number two, Jesus not only increased in uh, stature, he increased where? In wisdom, in knowledge. He developed mentally. I had mentioned to you last week that Jesus knew three languages. He knew Hebrew, he knew Greek, at the time it was called Koine Greek, and he knew Aramaic. How many of us here sitting here today can master another language? Can anybody speak another language besides English? Tom, what can you speak? Texan. Texan. (laughs) That is a unique language, Yes, yes indeed. But some people can speak Spanish. Some can speak uh, speak German, Portuguese, French, Italian. Jesus knew three languages. Do you not know that Jesus no doubt read the writings of the day? No doubt had access to what was then known as the word of God. It was not a complete volume like we have today, but he read He meditated. He studied. Just like we should. Study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing, handling accurately the word of truth. Number three. Jesus increased in favor with man. Meaning he was developing himself socially. He was coming to learn to live successfully with others around him. Jesus mastered conversation with people. He could talk to anybody. He could even face his bitterest enemies and talk to them, try to reason with them. We must come to learn to live successfully with others also. Why should we do this? Why should we develop socially? Because the very people we come in contact are our contacts to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're the ones that we need to teach. They're the ones we need to bring to Christ. So we we need to do our best to, to learn to live with them and to get along. But one should watch his associates because some associates can do what? Bring you uh, down, drag you down and take you away from God's purpose. Number four, Jesus increased in favor with God. 
He developed religiously. He made use of the resources that God had for him to spiritually develop. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. Second Corinthians chapter four and verse 16. So we do not lose heart, Paul writes, though our outer self is wasting away, what is it about the inner being? It's being renewed day by day. And what's that renewing? How do we renew ourselves? We study, we pray, we meditate, just like what Jesus was teaching us, just like Paul here is teaching us. Nothing will renew you like praying, exactly. Nothing will renew you like studying God's word. Nothing will renew you like being around God's people. So we need to renew ourselves daily. Knowing that this body that we're encased in is wasting away sickness and disease. So Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. That is full development of a human being. That is full development of the man that we should be in this life. As a youth, Christ was also, believe it or not, subject to parental authority. Go back, if you will, to our text, Luke chapter 2, and look at verse 51. The verse prior to seeing the way that he grew. Verse 51 tells us, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. And what's the key word of the verse? He was what? Obedient. He was submissive to them. So that, that's something very important to consider right there. Now, if you go back to the original languages that this was written in, the suggestion is the following. He kept on being subject to them. So in other words, this was a continuous action Verb. His obedience was continual. His obedience was also habitual. It was a form of habit that he came uh, to do. Notice another writing, if you will, would please, of, of the Apostle Paul. Turn, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It starts with the children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For what? This is right. Honor your father and mother. To which he says, this is the first commandment with promise. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. But here's some instructions to fathers. Verse 4. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger or wrath, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Teach them. Instruct them. Encourage them. So when they do that, they will be submissive and obedient to the things that you tell them to do. Teach them, train them to do what is right. And next we should note that as a youth, the Lord Jesus went to the house of God. Luke chapter 2, once again, if you will, go back to verse 46. Luke chapter 2 and verse 46, where it says the following. After three days, they found him 
in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Where was he? The temple. What was the temple at this time? The house of worship, the house of God. Our house of God is what today? The church. Oh, it's the church building? (laughs) The church is the people, that's right. Careful on that term building. Because what does the world conceive the church as? The building. It's this structure they think of. Oh, you're going to church. Well, I'm already the church because we're the called out people. But notice what the text says. The text also said, as his custom was. What does the term custom mean? Habit. Something you're used to doing. The way things are done. What's your habit on the Lord's Day? To be here with God's people. To be here with God's people. And even if you're traveling somewhere, you may want to make it a point to stop somewhere where God's people meet. Exactly. We should, we should recognize that point. Yes, that, you know, if, if there is a building in the community, make sure there's a sign there that says the Church of Christ meets here or Podunk Town Church of Christ. But here, the, the phrase really just strikes to me. It should strike to you as well. As his custom was. It was the custom of the people to be in the house of God. That tells us something right here, church. That number one, there is value in being with God's people. And number two, it is important to be with God's people. Hebrews 10.25, we should know this passage but let's take a look at it anyway. Hebrews 10 and verse 25. Starting with verse 24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the the day drawing near. There's purpose behind being in God's house. Oh, yes, we come to worship God. We sing praises to him. We pray to him. We remember his son, Jesus Christ, and participate in a great memorial feast remembering Christ. We give of our means. We listen to God's message, and we leave here. Is that all all there is to it? What is more to it? What is the more? It's being together with God's people and encouraging one another, smiling at one another, hugging one another, speaking kind words to one another. Exactly, exactly. There is that necessity of feeding upon God's word, but... There's the necessity of feeding upon one another. It's great that I can see you on on the Lord's day and be with you. And I I know likewise, you want to be with your brothers and sisters of like precious faith. Look at James chapter four and verse 17. James four and verse 17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. 
We should make it a point, a determination to be, if we can, if at all possible, to be with God's people on the Lord's day. But some people neglect it. Some people even purposely miss out. They'd rather be somewhere else or with somebody else. As a result, missing out on that opportunity does more harm than good. Notice something that is written by the writer Luke in the book of Acts. And we've been studying, as you know, on Sunday afternoon, the book of Acts. We would encourage you to come and be with us for that this afternoon at 2 o'clock. But look, if you will, at Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. There is something important about being with God's people. But it's also, according to the writer here, something that the people devoted themselves to. Notice the reading. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. All came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as many as had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Being with God's people, these people devoted themselves to one another. And notice what is written in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Upon the first day of the week when they gathered together to break bread, Paul preached unto them intending to depart on the next day and he prolonged his speech until midnight. It was the first day of the week and the purpose of them to come together and break bread. Meaning what? Remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the sacrifice that Christ had on the cross. That was a significant reason for these people to come to the house of God. As the custom is, as the custom was, Jesus came to the temple, to the house of God. The custom is for us to gather together upon the first day of the week, to break bread, to worship together, to encourage one another, to be part of God's family. Next, notice this. As a youth, Christ was anxious to be about his father's business. As we read a moment ago in Luke chapter 2, and verse 49, when his parents said, "Why?" or when Jesus rather said, why are you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? God has a business. It's the biggest business in the world. Amen. And what is that business, church? Spread to spread the word of God. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It is, as we said, the biggest business, business in the world. There's a lot of great businesses out there, don't get me wrong. But the biggest business is not a Fortune 500 company. The biggest business is not located in New York City or in Dallas, Texas. The biggest business comes from heaven and it's God's business telling us to go and make disciples of all the nations. And concerning God's business, we too must be anxious. We too must realize that God's business is something that should be concerning us Amen. because of the brevity of time. 
Souls must be reached with the gospel. We must come to a knowledge of God's word. And therefore, we must go and teach those people that wonderful message. As a youth, Jesus possessed a knowledge of the scriptures. After three days, they found him in the temp- temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all were, who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Brethren, that comes from a knowledge of God's word. And as I said earlier, Jesus was familiarizing himself with the word of the day. As we said, he did not have the complete volume of God's word, but he was becoming familiar with the the law. He was becoming familiar with the Old Testament and what was taking place then as well. He came to a knowledge of the word of God through study. We too must study, as we said earlier. Study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. And finally, we must realize that as a youth, Christ was industrious. What do you think Jesus was doing that all that time before his ministry? What was his father? A carpenter. Think Jesus picked up the trade along the way? He did. He was an industrious individual. The Jews said, and this is a statement of tradition, he who does not teach his son a trade teaches him to steal. Let, the, let, you, let you ponder that thought for just a moment. He who does not teach his son a trade teaches him to steal. No doubt Joseph mentored and tutored Jesus in the work of the carpentry business until it was time for Jesus to go out and mentor 12 men. Look at Mark chapter 6 and verse 3 for a moment. Mark chapter 6 and verse 3. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. And what, you know, this is a very interesting statement that the people make because Jesus had went away from there, came back to his hometown at this time. On the Sabbath, he was teaching in the synagogue There were those who were listening to Jesus and were astonished at what he was saying. Matter of fact, the people asked, look at uh, Mark Mark 6 and verse 2, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? And what was their next reply? Look at verse 3. Yes, ma'am. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And as a result, they took offense at this. Why should this young man have such great knowledge? But he did. He was an intelligent young man. Because these people did not not realize something. They didn't realize at the time. They were talking to who? The Son of God. But nonetheless, he was not welcomed even in his hometown. (laughs) Exactly. There is that sense of jealousness when you do no more. Look at Matthew for a moment. Matthew chapter uh, 13 and verse 55. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 55. 
And when, this is Matthew's account of the same thing we just read. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there, verse 53. Verse 54, coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue. And they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, his sisters here with us? Where did, then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Nonetheless, Jesus kept going and doing what his Lord and Master, his Father, told him to do. He did the work. Not only physical labor, but he did spiritual labor as well. He was again about his Father's business. He was about God's business. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28. Ephesians 4 and verse 28. Listen to what Paul says here. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, that he may have something to share with anyone in need. The honorableness, the value, and the profitability of working. And then notice also what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Now you'll remember, and we talked about it some last uh, Sunday afternoon in our lesson with Acts. What was Paul's trade at the time that he began preaching? He was a tent maker. He was working. <clears throat> Work is honorable. Let us be about the Father's business like Jesus was and increase and grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. All right, let's do a little quick review as we close out this morning. We talked about last week, if you remember, the pre-existence of Christ, that term. What was meant by the pre-existence of Christ? Always there. Jesus was, Jesus is, and Jesus ever will be. He was in the beginning. He was there throughout the entire Bible. We read in the Old Testament of the coming of Christ. We read in the New Testament of the life of Christ. And we read in the Bible the, the, the life that we should live in Christ Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible speaks of Christ. What prophecies did the Old Testament contain regarding the birth of Christ? If you can just give me one, that's good enough. What's the one we're, we're most familiar with? It's in Isaiah. It was quoted by and studied by uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Isaiah 53, where he was like the sheep, he was like the lamb that was led before the slaughter. We also mentioned something about, and re, uh, we use this term, that Christ came in the fullness of time. What were the factors contributing to that point? What were some of the things that uh, me mentioned about the fullness of Christ and the fullness of time? Again, if you just mention one thing, that's good enough. The Roman yes, the Roman government. What arguments and evidence is offered by those who deny the virgin birth of Christ? What arguments and evidence is offered by those who deny the virgin birth of Christ? Is there evidence out there? Well, we've got the Bible and that's all we need. 
That's right. We have the word of God with the evidence that tells us about these things. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We, were we there when Christ was born? No, none of us were. But we have the evidence and the proof that, that it's there. We were not there when the world was created, but we do know through the evidence that God in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. It's answered by the word. What evidence can we give to confirm the virgin birth of Christ? Again, the scripture itself gives us evidence that Jesus was born of a virgin. We talked about it today. What was the development of Jesus as a child and a young man? Simple term, he what? He grew. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And finally, what facts can be gleaned from the scriptures concerning the early life of Christ and his growth to manhood? It's not much, but there are a, there is evidence enough that gives us this time, this period of Christ between his birth and his ministry. And it, it's summed up in those two verses we read in Luke chapter 2, especially Luke 2 and verse 52. We can glean from that one passage, I contend, church, enough evidence that tells us that Jesus was developing as a young man to become the man that in three years ministered and mentored 12 men telling those men to go out and preach the gospel. Those are the facts we need to know concerning the life of Christ. And next Sunday morning when we get together, we will discuss lesson two, the next event in Christ's life, his baptism. Let's pray. God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we can be together this morning to do discover and study your word and learn the great treasures from it. I'm thankful, Father, for each one of these individuals here who have come this morning as students to learn. Thank you, Father, for this time that we can teach and discuss these things. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to understand more about the life of Christ and to share this life with others. Thank you for our time to be together, be with us as we worship you, Father, in spirit and in truth in mere moments. Thank you again, Father. In Jesus' name we pray.